We have our panel discussion and Yu Lan is our first presenter. So Yu, um, could you, thank you. You're, uh, Yu Lan's a doctoral student in geography in the Department of Geography and Earth Sciences at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Her research interests include spatial epidemiology, geovisualization, and web GIS in health geography. And she wrote one of the four articles. Each of our authors here is going to briefly cover the high points of their articles, if that's possible, and uh, in a 10 minutes uh, session. And then please, uh, throughout this, you can put questions into the public session chat, and I'll try and gather them and uh, direct them to the authors. Thank you, you. Thank you so much. So uh, I will start the, the, the discussion first. So. As, uh, as just uh, be, be introduced, here is the, my topic, my papers for this panel. And so the first question that we have is that why do we need geolization for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? And we think that because this uh, COVID-19 disease pandemic is very close related to the both the dynamic in both space time and we think is highly sensitive to space not only in spatial so that's why we think uh it's very valuable to discuss those visualizations in both space and time that's what we come from and then we look at some examples of uh combinating dashboard uh last year i think that the, before this is published we is uh, around uh, the fall and the summer, and we, uh, we, 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 we look at some very popular dashboard for COVID-19, and as you can see that what they use the method, the dashboard use the visualization method, they just uh, uh, visualize the cases or, or deaths as the points. So in some area, you or in some scale, you will just see a very density points and uh, another interesting that we found is that for the the world health organization that's what it was using this uh, uh if you can see my mouse if the, it, it it has used the the points before but later they changed to a curve map maps here however we all the both two dashboards only show the cases at that day. Uh, in in other words, we cannot to go back to the, the day before to see the change in the times. And based on the this source, we come up with some solutions that combine with all those uh, components to to address these solutions, these these issues. And we think. One way to do is to uh, to integrate interaction animation and space time cube to visualize the the coordinating data, and that's uh, why we want to do this. And this is our motivation to do so. And therefore, we have these three different interactive visualizations. The first one is a binary map. And the second one is a spike map. And the last one is a 3D space time map. And first of all, let me just brief introduce some data source and preparation for the data that we will use to visualize. Uh, we use the COVID-19 daily cases and deaths from the uh, January 25 to October 1st in, in the US by at the county level. And all this data can be uh, retrieved uh, from the GitHub of the John Hawkins universities. And we also uh, implement with this space time scan status on the cases. If you're interested, you can find the, uh, the details for the methods in our uh, another papers list here. So here are some visualization variables that we used to uh, visualized. I will also introduce very soon. 
So here, let me introduce some visualizations that we have. Uh, the first one is the barrier maps. And uh, the advantage of using barrier map is that we can show uh, two attributes at the same time by different colorings. And uh, it, the barrier map have very long history in using in the epidemiology. And it's well, it's also well acknowledged by both geography and epidemiologists. And for this one, we use two variables. The, the first one is the relative risk for each county on a particular days. And the other two, uh, the other variables is the number of days that each county belong to a significant space time cluster during the previous 14 days. And here is the screenshot when we stop at one time and then the user can hold in any of the county to get the the exact numbers for these counties. And here is another figure that we take screenshot at multiple days, and we also compared uh, two different areas. And the next one is the spike map that we, we, we think is also interesting to visualize uh, the, the data in the, in the linear scale the symbol. So the advantage of a spike is that it, it can avoid cre creating a lot of, of overlap, such as the circles that we just I just mentioned in the early. Uh, and also it have a definite directions. So let, let's show you the result. The first, this one is the screenshot for one day. And the similar, you can hope to any of the spike to see the actual uh, value, which is o ODM. And here is also the figure that show the compares the, these two different areas, the different time uh, of the how it looks like in the spike map. And once one research also mentioned that spike, spike map uh, may be easy, more easy to be understood by the public than the barrier map. And lastly, we have this 3D dimension space time that map the dynamic of the COVID-19 deaths across the US, United States. And uh, here is the result that we have. And the, you can see we have this background map using the population density and the, the, the cylinders means the 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 temporal the height is the the the, the time and the uh, x y is the each plot so in that way we think we can uh, show the changes around the time and also around the space um, so that's uh, that's the discussion that we conclude. And uh, I think most uh, important is that uh, for my for my dissertation, I will I will continue working on the space time uh, analysis and the and the visualization. So I will try to combine the both two D and three D interactive in one website web based website. So uh, and I will also want to make it to be public. So anyone can use that too easily to get a, a quickly understand about what's going on. And it also shows the power of cartography because I think it's very important by using that, not just showing the cases by, by, the, by the size of circles as most uh, dashboards used. So I guess it's terminates. That's, that's pretty much all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, that was really, really interesting. And you did a great job of, of looking at the high points of the article. Uh, we're going to hold all the questions until after all four speakers. Uh, so if you can mute yourself, thank you. And Fox, if you can uh, turn yours on and uh, get set up. And uh, I uh, guess I just want to remind people that you can either uh,
collect your questions uh, yourself and, and put them all in to the chat at the end or else uh, enter them as we go along and I'll try to uh, I'll try to uh, gather them and oppose them in some with some semblance of organization to the speakers at the end okay uh, thanks Fox are you ready to go yeah I'm ready okay uh, hello, I'm Fox, a health geographer at the University of Calgary. I'm going to discuss the use of simplified maps to explore the pandemic in Canada. I'll go into the design and of a simplified map and discuss different ways I visualize the pandemic and end with a few points uh, from hindsight. Uh, for Canada, the appeal of a simplified map to me was the spatial arrangement of Canada's provinces and territories. This design sits two boxes high and nine boxes wide. The compact and horizontal arrangement lends itself well to compare the variable over time in rows. Uh, I managed to retain adjacency in most situations. The exceptions were the Northwest Territories and Nunavut, which are adjacent to more than one province. I ended up staggering them, all the, all the territories with one space between them. The other exceptions were the Atlantic provinces, uh, I moved Prince Edward Island down because I didn't want to add a third row. I, you could either um, you could either uh, put Prince Edward Island between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, or you could move it down or move Newfoundland up, which I didn't want to do because I wanted two rows so I could try to maximize um, uh, the temporal visuals I made. I'm calling this simplified map a topological map for lack of a better term. I went, ended up going through a lot of my old textbooks and uh, some cartography authors, and I couldn't really find a specific name for this sort of visual. The map tries to preserve relationships at the expense of distance and shape. Um, if anyone else has a better term, let me know. Uh, this version of the map uses a barcode style graph inside each box to show COVID cases throughout most of 2020. Uh, the data was from January to November. The top map shows the absolute number of cases, while the bottom shows the number of cases relative to each uh, province or territory's population. To no surprise, Ontario and Quebec, which have the largest populations, had the most cases. Uh, below that, uh, relative to population, Western provinces were hit just as bad as Central Canada. Atlantic Canada and the territories were virtually unscathed until the Nunavut's outbreak in November. Uh, I used vertical barcode stripe as graphs after seeing them used to report changing temperature over time in climate graphs. I felt that line graphs would not have worked as well, considering that provinces and territories of low values would have had lines that we could hardly see at all. Using a barcode style display, we can easily see at least the range of values for each week, although we don't get the, the same precision that a line graph provides. Uh, moving on to a monthly display, we can more easily identify where the first and second waves were. Uh, the first wave is around April to May, while the second wave uh, was from October to January. Although the data set here only goes to November, so that, that's all I have. Where the barcode graphs allows us to identify trends quickly, um, week to week, this expanded month to month display as rooms for, for time labels. Uh, however, it does take longer for us to identify the trends because our eyes have to move back and forth across the rows. Um, next up is bivariate display of four different variables. I'm not sure how useful this exercise was, because it presents one visual for data from an 11 month period. I'll talk more about that in the next slide. The shaded colors are cases relative to population, like we've seen before for the period January to November. The first row has inner box sizes proportional to the percentage of population that each province or territory makes up of Canada. So the territories are each 0.1% of the total population and Ontario is about 38% of the population. So the first row is kind of an interesting visual, but it's not that useful. Uh, the second row shows the mortality from COVID relative to the number of cases in each area. From my speculation, the Warsaw provinces, uh, like here we've got Nova Scotia, 
were from serious outbreaks in long-term care centers that it sort of skewed things. I think hospitalization would have been a better variable to use than mortality. The third row shows the percentage of testing for COVID within each province or territory. I was confused at the variation we see for testing. I know that the provinces have different definitions of what constituted COVID-19, but I imagine that after a few months into the pandemic, the governments would have been using the same definition. I'm not sure. Um, other differences in testing values may have to do with deciding in different provinces and territories whether only people with symptoms should be tested. I also wasn't sure if some provinces may have not counted each person uniquely in their tally. For example, I was tested for COVID twice last year. Did each province account for, for, for that? Uh, the fourth and final row shows the percentage of people who recovered from COVID. And this is really the, use, the least useful variable here because it spans 11 months. Uh, being presented over a period of 11 months, the proportion of recovered along with the other variables seems to reflect activity in the last month in this time period, which in this case was the upswing of the second wave in November. It would have been far more useful to arrange each of the three bottom variables into their own sets of columns um, by month, mortality, testing, and recovery. I think we could have seen um, more important patterns and trends that way. Uh, finally, in hindsight, uh, developing the Simplified Map was fun. Uh, there were two main challenges, though. Uh, one, it was hard to decide on class ranges for COVID cases because as the pandemic was a developing event, we didn't know how high cases might peak. I ended up using Jenks natural breaks in the last draft of this manuscript. But if I had known what the maximum value would have been, I'm, I would have tried manual classification with uh, easily understandable ranges. Um, for example, uh, for two COVID dashboards that I update each week for digestive diseases, I've recently switched those maps from using natural breaks to using uh, manual classes so that each of my monthly snapshot maps of previous months all have the same class ranges when you flip between them to see the changing trend. Uh, also, some other researchers that I've worked with have also commented that it's a little confusing to see the classes recalculated every week with, with the natural breaks. Uh, and, and two, I obviously designed the simplified map of Canada manually for one-time use. If I had to update it daily or weekly as a dashboard, I would have probably created a shapefile, zoomed in, you know, so there's no distortion, with provinces and territories, along with week and month IDs to link the data. Um, I was planning to do that, but I didn't have enough time. Uh, and uh, thank you for listening to my talk. Great, thanks, Fox. Uh, uh, very interesting, very interesting stuff. And uh, I'm not sure if cartogram would help or not, or just confuse matters. But uh, mm. uh, we can ask, ask the audience if they have any suggestions for for what the topological uh, uh, simplified topological map could also be called. Okay, thank you. Could you uh, turn off your camera, and I'll ask uh, Klaus Rinner to uh, put his stuff, put his face and his uh, presentation up. Klaus is a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at Ryerson University. And he's you know, researched and te taught in uh, GIS, cartography, decision support systems, and applications in public health, social policy, and environmental planning. And of course, a long time CCA stalwart. So uh, thank you, Klaus, and uh, uh, the clock is running. <laughs> oh, um, thank you, Byron. Um, and I uh, hope you can all see me and my PowerPoint. Um, I'm joining you from beautiful Wasaka Beach, Ontario. Um, to talk about the article I wrote uh, in the special issue um, on mapping COVID-19 in context, promoting a proportionate perspective on the pandemic. Um, uh, so to, I, I am coming at COVID from a bit of a skeptical uh, perspective. And so for me, it was important in the article to include 
um, extensive literature and see um, what, what uh, um, perspectives are present. So you here I'm trying to give a few examples of um, the, the, the scare that's out there um, where we had uh, models um, predicting millions of deaths in the first wave of um, the pandemic, critical supply shortages, Bill Gates talking in an article about uh, once in a century pandemic, the idea of zero COVID um, that um, as a goal. And <clears throat> I didn't mention this in the article, but um, I think a lot of these, uh, a lot of this narrative is based on the uh, threat of asymptomatic transmission. So people who look healthy can transmit the disease. And that is increasingly being questioned, um, that that plays a significant role in the pandemic. On the other hand, um, I've read a lot more um, personally, but not necessarily in the mainstream media, about um, the shrinking estimates of the infection fatality ratio, um, pre-existing immunity, which was initially denied, um, a study from Germany that I was familiar with because it was in my home region um, that found even within a household there was less than half uh, the time there was transmission between two members of a household. And then um, the, uh, the seasonality and the uh, natural evolution of, of a virus, seasonality and the temporal aspect that you um, talked about in the first talk. Um, and so overall, um, there were um, lots of concerns about um, the collateral damage of the response um, uh, lockdowns, essentially, and, and the, uh, the view that there was a global false alarm happening. And then uh, from, from there, um, I was looking at the data um, with interest and, and probably though with a different, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, baseline. Um, and um, I'm seeing a lot of problems in the data. And Fox, interestingly, just mentioned a few that, that are uh, related to the testing regime. So a lot of the critical um, COVID metrics are based on the PCR tests results, uh, positive test results. Um, the more you test, the more cases you'll get based on the nature of the test, um, the, the sensitivity of the test. And depending on how the test is run, the more cases there will be. And I think Fox mentioned the, the, the way that things are run even between different provinces within the country of Canada is um, sometimes not even defined or, or differs. Um, 20, like a, a, a large number between 20 and 80% of cases um, of people who rep are represented in the cases aren't actually ill. Um, and uh, there's an impact of the testing regime on uh, the data, for example, about hospitalizations and about death from um, or with COVID. Nevertheless, the politicians, media and the public are fixated on those raw count data. Um, and uh, in my view, COVID and the, the data, but also the phenomenon of the pandemic itself is completely taken out of um, context and proportion. So I did want to uh, make a counterpoint in the article and that specific, uh, specifically with respect to mapping. So um, the, the data issues kind of translate into issues with mapping that have been discussed by a number of people throughout last year and also today. Um, already of the, the issues with data normalization prior to mapping, spatial units being used, um, symbology, <clears throat> classification color choice. I just want to highlight one of the authors, which is Kenneth Field from Esri, uh, so from industry, who wrote in February 2020 that we should, for example, not use red color schemes in order not to over uh, exaggerate 
the numbers, the, the small, the relatively small numbers. Um, you do see up to this day um, many examples that contradict uh, all of these recommendations that were made. Um, one of my favorite examples uh, is the CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. For most of last year, this uh, is how their map looked. This is from October. So we see a raw count of confirmed COVID-19 cases per province um, drawn as a core path map, something that should not be done. Um, <clears throat> they use the red color scheme uh, and um, there's no, so raw count, there's no relation to the underlying population, of course. And yeah, and they even cut off an, a significant part of Northern Canada <laughs> to make the map fit uh, onto their page. Um, I have a couple of other examples, but I already see that I'll, I'll have to skip them. I, I added them at the end. I will now just show two of my um, counter examples if you want. So uh, admittedly, I think I'm exaggerating on the other side uh, of things. Um, so I wanted to show what it would like if you uh, find a symbol that represents the small, certain small numbers um, that we're facing here um, in, in uh, proportion. And so this is from October. Numbers obviously have changed a bit. Um, hospitalizations with COVID uh, out of total acute care bed capacity. Um, for the provinces. So nationally it was 1,000 COVID patients uh, compared to 50 over 50,000 beds. Um, and the highest percentage was in Quebec with 4%. And um, I realized this only this morning when I was going through the talk in my head, 4.4%, uh, my intention was to show a 4% gray. And um, I actually missed this in uh, looking at the proofs of the journal because this is what I submitted. Uh, you probably can't even see that this is a gray. And this was my map um, showing a 4% gray for Quebec, a 1.7% gray for Ontario, for example. So the art and actual, it was based on uh, the alpha channel in QGIS. So the transparency um, of 96% for Quebec, for example. Um, so um, this is was the, what the uh, journal's um, map uh, 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 editor, I guess, made made of this, and unfortunately, I missed that. And the other example, um, watching my time here, is uh, City of Toronto by neighborhoods. They uh, provide those data, and um, they've also, after some time, initially um, of mixing up all cases. They separated the community cases, which they used to call recent sporadic cases. I think that's a new uh, term now. Um, so, and to me, you know, for the general public, those are the important cases. So uh, you subtract the long-term care home cases. This is someone else from industry, from Esri Canada, who actually made me aware of this in June or so. Um, so we see the community cases in black and then we see total population in gray and um, you might not see the black dots and that was my intention to show that there's so few that you won't uh, be able to find them i call this the where's waldo style dot density map and um, now um, uh, I think jennifer johnston um cartographer from britain who talked on tuesday about uh, color use in maps um, gave me the idea, listening to her, gave me the idea that I wish Waldo is actually a pretty colorful uh, children's book. And um, I just quickly made a color version of this that uses four different colors for total population uh, to kind of in, on the map hide the red dots of which there's only few for the COVID cases. Um, so there's orange, yellow, blue and green that represents total population and um, if you're lucky you might be able to find a red dot um, like uh, a, a waldo hiding among the total population so um yeah i've been interested in the role of maps 
in decision making and so here in the context of the potentially misleading role in my view of maps in decision making i, I don't think it's there's been an immediate impact on decisions quite uh, opposite to models that have been used directly like for example by the provincial government in ontario um, for decisions on lockdown extension and stay-at-home orders um, still i think these maps that we've uh, talked about um, are making an impact on uh, the public and maybe on journalists and on professionals and so on so i see the map makers at the risk of contributing to unwarranted fear to panic to overreaction and i have a little uh, bit on the jazz code of ethics in the paper it was uh, uh, on the basis of um, a workplace issue in Florida where the GIS analyst was hired uh, potentially for political reasons, but there are two different uh, sides to that story. So I don't want to um, bring that up again, but in looking at the code of ethics, it, it requires the GIS professional to be objective, to um, provide accurate information, to be aware of good and bad consequences, to strive to do what's right. and I'm not, like since last year, I'm not so sure anymore how easy or possible it is for us to actually determine what's accurate, what's good, and what's right. Thank you. Uh, always a difficult question. So, um, thank you both. We're getting some feedback, I think. Um, oh, that's better. Um, thank you, Klaus. That should prompt a few questions. Um, so next, I would like Samuel Waterstrom to to uh, briefly present uh, uh, his article. Um, he's a professor of geography in uh, the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences at Brigham Young University in Utah, and studies historical and contemporary population, cultural, and settlement geography. And his article looks at maps of the United States and uh, has some very interesting cartographic uh, ideas. Samuel, can you turn on your camera and share your screen, please? Yeah, I'm try trying to get the screen shared here. Um, it's not coming up. Uh-huh. Well, you have to click on it and wait for it for a few seconds. Okay. There it is. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Seth. All right. Well, it's great to be with you today. This is a very interesting session, and um, I've uh, learned a lot through this uh, this process of of uh, looking at data and something that Klaus is talking about too, in terms of trying to do your best with the data that you have in, in uh, showing, um, you know, showing patterns. And so that's what we try to do with this. I've done other work with looking at population uh, uh, change and relative populations and, uh, and other types of variables. And so what we wanted to do with this is looking at the relative uh, concentrations of, of COVID-19 in, in, in cases and mostly in deaths in the United States. And, and also looking at how um, these patterns relate not just to state boundaries, but into a trade area or what we call city system boundaries. And so that they, there's a little difference there saying, well, if there's, there's a communicable spread, then maybe it, there's more to do with, or could be something to do with not just states boundaries, but also interactions within an economic region. So we calculated these statistics um, that we'll talk about briefly here in, in both the, um, <clears throat> the state level and the city system or trade area level. And uh, we used both what, what's the Hoover index of concentration to do this as well as the uh, what we call the differential geographical index uh, or what's also known as a modified Duncan index. 
um, and using it both as a global measure as well as um, down to the county uh, constituent in terms of that data. So um, this differential geographic index uh, this was just mentioning there uh, will show uh, what, what happened in, in terms of each county its relative um, number of cases or deaths compared to populate the relative population in the whole system or the whole United States in some cases or the whole uh, trade area or city system. And, and so if there's a higher value, um, more than that's going to come up in red and the lower value in green. And then you have the light blue that's in, in the early, early times there were not uh, cases or deaths shown. So this first map from, from May 4th, just over a year, year ago, um, with cases, the counties in blue had not, up to this point, um, shown any, any deaths, any, any cases of COVID, and those in the red would have higher, um, much higher uh, numbers of cases than, than, the, than the average compared to their population, uh, and then the, in the green, in the darkest green, lower uh, number of cases uh, than the average. And that's the same thing in, in terms of deaths. Early on, the, the deaths are very concentrated in the Northeast Corridor, uh, in uh, Louisiana, Southern Louisiana, in uh, parts of the Native American reservations in Arizona, and Northwestern um, New Mexico there. So um, looking at just the same thing, but going forward in time, these individual uh, county components of the G DG index uh, with uh, the reds kind of coming up and they'll start to shift over time. So this is June 11th and um, we're still, where we have the Northeast still being very, um, very concentrated and much higher than, rel you know, relatively speaking, than, than the other parts of, of, of the states, even there, such as New York or Pennsylvania um, but, but also compared to other parts of the United States. And um, by August 11th, what's happened here is there's a, there's a shift. And so once again, these with the, the cases, this is um, over time, uh, you know, the cumulative number of cases. So it's, it's not just the case of that time, but the number of cases over time. And as accumulate, and then you, you have a different a relative number. So you can see the shift to the south and to the southwest. Um, and, and there's you know, a lot of interesting geographic patterns that we don't have uh, time to get into here. Um, but you, that's, uh, but then, then by, um, by December, four months later, there's a shift back uh, to the north and uh, the central part of the, the, the country with Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota uh, being very high and, um, and then other places such as the Northeast where they were, were initially very high, uh, kind of going back down towards average or even less, less than average. You look at the same thing for deaths, a um, little, bit, little bit different, but August, you can see the move to the South, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, well, Louisiana's there already before, but in uh, and Georgia and Alabama uh, and Arizona and the Southwest by uh, December, with the, with the deaths in the DG index, it was much um, you know, more spread to the middle uh, the, of the country and some of the areas less populated. And so um, just looking briefly at the Hoover index in terms of, of, um, of, of death, the way we com compared the uh, numbers of deaths within a, the region with the population. And so um, the in terms of uh, these dates, so the, the concentration is much higher with the, the green in terms of deaths versus the population concentration. And over, over time, you can see that becomes less so, where, where like Charlotte and Dallas were very similar to the population concentration levels of, of the two. By December, actually, most um, regions, a lot of the regions had uh, more concentrate, you know, more dispersed, excuse me, levels of, of deaths, meaning more deaths in the rural areas generally um, than in the, the, uh, the, the population centers. So actually, a uh, greater population concentration of 
the, the population itself. But the DG index, um, this has, uh, you know, goes by the county by county, so you're really looking at the county changes uh, compared with this relative population versus relative values for, for deaths in this case. So in May, you have a much, much higher uh, concentration there, a uh, differential concentration. You go over time, though, it spreads uh, down, and by December, um, there it's much closer to the the population distribution, uh, very very similar. And those you know very low values uh, mean you know, with you know, between zero and ten or twenty are showing very low, um, well very similar distribution of population versus the relative distribution of of deaths in this case, and so. We do this, you know, lastly here with this using the city system boundaries uh, and to see if there's how this actually that, that's the point of reference in each one is the relative amounts with, within the city systems of, of deaths in December. And you can see in many, in some cases where there's, where it's out in the rural areas in the, you know, versus the, the actual uh, core where the greater deaths were and uh, which is interesting, not always, but in some cases, you can see this um, going on there. So um, in summary, you know, I, mean, I, I like to think about the future. I, I haven't really, this is since December, really up, updated this, but there's uh, be interesting to see with, with the in, increased amount of data that's out there, what's happened with this distribution. But the basic thing is that uh, we started in the rural, uh, the concentrated in the, city areas and move to the rural areas. And that's a lot of people leaving town saying, we got to move out of town because we're going to uh, receive this, get sick. And really, it was just a matter of time until it diffused to the rural areas and actually was worth it, where the death rate was worse in the rural areas, possibly because of access to health care or uh, reticence, people not wanting to go get uh, care. So that's a quick summary there. And there's, there's a lot of interesting patterns that we, we found. Thank you. Samuel, thank you very much. It's it's fascinating work. Um, I think I'd like uh, all four panelists uh, to turn their cameras on uh, right now, if they don't mind, so the audience can see us. And um, I'll ask uh, members of the audience, attendees, I'll turn mine off. There's no need they have to see me. But uh, I'll ask uh, attendees to uh, go to the public session chat and to uh, put their questions into there. Thank you to all four speakers for your, your articles in the first place and secondly for agreeing to, to uh, join in uh, this exercise. Um, and uh, Shane, um, Doddridge has uh, responded in the chat to uh, Klaus's um, article, but I may I may ask all of you. Uh, Shane has said, "How has the reaction been to your article?" Uh, and in his case, are you optimistic that others will follow this trend to challenge the public narrative by digging into the data? But I guess um, if the rest of you also would like to comment, uh, sort of uh, do. Uh, Close you, Fox, and, and Samuel, uh, about whether there's been any reaction. And also, I should mention that um, this was um, all of these articles were submitted in the fall of 2020, which was sometimes only at the beginning uh, of the so called second wave. And so uh, a lot has changed since then, obviously. And uh, I'd also like to take on, uh, you know, if there's something you would have changed uh, in retrospect, uh, if you could comment on that. So I can't remember what order I said now, but I guess <laughs> close you, Fox and Sam. Uh, you're muted, close. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question, uh, Shane. Um, 
Uh, I have, I don't think I've received direct reaction to this article. I have experience, um, one time experience in my career with receiving a lot of reaction to an, uh, an op-ed that I wrote for the Toronto Sun in December, asked pretty much just asking questions along similar lines. And there was huge reaction, positive and negative, and like, you know, across the spectrum, like some too positive and some asking how I could keep my job when I'm asking questions like this. Um, but to the second part of your question, um, there are people in, out there in the community and in uh, academia as well who uh, come to very different conclusions. They're just not well uh, profiled or represented in the media. Um, they are in the scientific literature if you if you look for it. And um, so on Twitter, for example, um, I'm kind of in a little ecosystem where there's a lot of great data analysis and um, graphing happening. It often comes from financial analysts or economists, economists who are conducting cost-benefit analysis for lockdown and things like that. So it's less on the mapping side, I would say, that I have mm, seen uh, the examples, the critical examples that I uh, presented here. But on the data side, yeah, there's a lot happening. It's just not really coming to the forefront or it is now increasingly coming to the forefront. Yeah, I agree. There's a, an awful lot of good data visualization. Uh, you, have you had reaction to, to the article? I, I'm also very interested in, you know, the difficulties and your, some of the solutions you came up in terms of mapping change over time and uh, how important it is to show uh, timely mapping uh, as well as to have timely data. Uh, yes, sure. So I have presented this article several times until now. And then, um, so one reaction that I got is that some uh, some students are really interesting in the in the web platform that I use to design this and uh, this uh, visualization online. It's, it's like a GitHub. You can just uh, reference others' code and then create a visualization on their site directly. So in that time, in which means that you don't need to have a, a server on your site to make the visualizations be able to be public. So that's good side. And uh, another reaction, I guess, uh, I think is, uh, I use this, uh, this the barrel map and also the, the spike map as to apply a KG award and it the award. So I think people like it, so that's good. Yeah. And uh, so uh, for the second question, I think we are we post these uh, methods because we think is is rare be captured in the in the dashboard last year. Like I'm not sure uh, for now if whether there is more space time visualization, but I did see when I do the literature about space time analysis. I did see there are very uh, not that much compared to the uh, to, to the sequence spatial analysis methods that used in the epidemiology like infectious disease. So that's I guess we want to emphasize that the importance of the space time methods using in the uh, infectious disease and the the next step for those for those methods will be how we can uh, realize these results in space and time so they can be uh, be better uh, explored by the not only geographers and also the epidemiologists that who may not very familiar with those methods so they can make right. some so they can make some decisions public 
like house decisions to control or uh, to detection any patterns, special space time patterns that can help to stop the, the pandemic. That's right. what, I, what that we want to help in that way. Right. Uh, Fox, uh, uh, your take, and there's another question for you in the chat just well, he's asking if you've published, uh, Tim Elrex asked if you've published these visualizations. I guess most of what you've shown was in the article in Cartographica, wasn't it? That's true, yeah. yeah. And have you had any reaction to it? And also, if anybody wants to uh, put in the chat their suggestions for other, other uh, terminology for the simplified topological map that's Fox. Uh, but in, we're, we're taking uh, candidate. Yeah, I haven't had any any anyone outside of my my research group uh, respond about the visuals. But um, some people have really liked it, especially the barcode visual, which isn't my invention. It, it's well, obviously not. Probably none of this is my invention. I'm sure. Uh, I know it isn't. Um, but the barcode style visual really speaks to people. It, it's really good for looking at visual uh, for temporal trends. Um, and yeah, yeah, the have all been published in, in the latest issue. Uh, I have had some pushback in epidemiology. I work in an epi epidemiology lab about uh, not using any any sort of visual that's, that's sort of esoteric. We have to use like a simple oral plot map for, for pretty much everything. But I think um, I think if I put this on Twitter and said, "Here's the dashboard with all these with all these sorts of visuals simplified," I think people would pick it up and run with it really easily. Um, I didn't show it in my presentation, but I did have a slide where I said, just, "You know, core path maps are really good for uh, for showing specific areas like subregions, and that's great." And having a a simplified map underneath it with a the temporal trend is also really useful too. So I think they supplement each other rather than replace each other. Mm -hmm. And Samuel, has there been uh, much reaction to the article? And uh, I'm interested in your use of non-conventional uh, uh, territorial polygons and uh, the city-centered ones and the others. Uh, uh, not unusual in, in our world, but uh, has there been any public reaction? Uh, no, there hasn't. I, I did present uh, this in poster form at the AAG meeting, um, and so it was, it was you know, fine there. It was pretty specific. It was a, like a medical session there, uh, but I haven't, in, in terms of using this method, uh, received any other kind of feedback that way. Um, but I think it's I'd like to be able to explore more in terms of what's happened and part of what the class has brought up too in terms of data and the, in terms of deaths we're trying to figure out uh, you know in the United States there's still questions on what classification of deaths and so um, we took uh, you know we took it at face value but we did mention in the article that there's there's issues of you know comorbidities and so forth that we didn't want to deal with so I, I would like to see in terms of patterns uh, if it's true it, it continued to go uh, disperse dispersing to the rural areas and little it'd be explored a little bit more at that city system level meaning is it is that a better predictor of spread at a tr with the trade area versus a state which i think it would would be but it's it's really hard to uh, show uh, generally so i think um that's uh, that's something that that uh would be good. I, it would take me a little bit of work. It took a lot of work to kind of get the data to the point that we could do this. So I'd have to pull up uh, some of the more recent months to see how it shifted to do the same thing we did up, up until December. Right. So I, I'd like, if the audience um, uh, would like to pose any questions to the, uh, the panel, I'm uh, be happy to pass these along. Do you? Yeah, Roger's making the point, which I, I think we've made that these articles were all in uh, Cartographica in in the first issue of 2021, and and they're also posted at the bottom of your screen uh, in PDF files. I didn't ask permission, so 
I don't. I hope I don't get in trouble with you if you press. Um, Byron, there's there's another question about mortality statistics. You want to look at that? Sure. Uh, Tim from McGill asked <clears throat> about um, the 2020, in particular the start of 2020 mortality. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'll believe you that COVID had the highest or, or significant role. So in terms of looking at proportions and context, my first question would be in other years, what was the role of respiratory diseases then, right? And how does it compare to the role of COVID in that uh, period? Um, I have, all, I think I've only looked for my blog about um, into uh, all-cause mortality. Actually, just recently, a couple of days ago, I posted about the 2020 mortality data. It's, it's news to me that mortality data are so difficult and much delayed um, in Canada to, to get a hold of. So I had written the post in March, but there was one week missing and I never became aware <laughs> that that week was finally posted. And I don't think there's excess mortality like from like my understanding in Canada. While in the US, I believe there is a significant excess mortality, but like someone was maybe hinting, could be a question of how um, like how deaths are uh, classified and therefore where they come from. Um, uh, so yeah. I can see is heart disease, um, can different cancers, uh, Alzheimer's are leading causes of death in the developed world in Canada and elsewhere. Right. Well, I don't want to get too much into the details of, of, of the data because there are there are uh, you know pros and cons of, uh, and qualifying conditions, whatever data are used. Right. Uh, Actually, when, good point. There, there's a suggestion um, that Tim uh, says uh, something along the lines that maybe would have been better instead of the maps that that are out there to to show these relationships between cause of death, uh, COVID versus other causes of death during that time. I think I think we can agree on that. Uh huh. Well, and selection of data is obviously sort of at the base of of of, uh, of, of uh, communicating with maps. Um, uh, I, one thing that's very interesting to me, especially in the Canadian context, is the question of um, uh, acute care, uh, mapping the uh, potential overloading of the, of the hospital system. Uh, because in many cases, that has, uh, seems to be the critical uh, uh, most uh, dangerous aspect, uh, not only for COVID patients, but for all of the rest of us. I wonder if anyone has ideas about that. I would have loved to have gotten that data, honestly. Uh, I noticed that, uh, especially at Nunavut had the outbreak, and when I read about that, they only had a dozen beds or something really, really small. So beds would have been really nice to uh, uh, to normalize or, or something with cases and, and mortality. From what I can tell, there's big questions about those data. Um, whenever I've seen a report on hospital overload in a city, like in Toronto, for example, in a period, that there, there's been competing reports about either it was the same thing last year and the year before because of flu. Like hospitals do run at 100 or over 100% capacity, while this year they did run at 70, 80, 85%. Um, so it's, it goes back to the, the proportionality of the data and context. What, what did happen before? Um, how long is this happening? Are there beds elsewhere or nearby that patients can be uh, brought to? Right. Cleo, did you have something to contribute? Yeah, to? I was 
I was going to just say, um, actually, within our dashboard, twice a week, um, we have a map with our nursing homes and our adult, our other adult care facilities and our hospitals, and we publish um, the amount of beds we have and the amount of beds uh, in use every twice a week. Um, but we do not publish uh, which beds are in use for COVID patients. That's kept uh, private because of the, lo the, the location. Um, but yeah, you can, in our dashboard, that's available twice a week. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. It, it, it goes back to the, the timeliness of data and, and, and uh, communication uh, with the public. Have you had a lot of, uh, of reaction to the dashboard and the other maps that uh, your department's put up, Cleo? Um, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> there's lots of comments. Um, uh, I think m most of it's been fairly positive. Um, most of the negative comments are more directed towards the policies and less towards the information. Um, and one thing that I know Robert and I have been super adamant about and had lots of meetings with people about from the beginning is that we want our na numbers to add up. So whether it's beds or vehicle cross, like vehicle vehicles crossing our borders or uh, um, deaths or whatever it is, um, all the numbers add up together. So it's uh, it's been pretty important to us. Right, well, uh, I mean, uh, the, the policies are, uh, are uh, I mean, the decision-making influence of, of the mapping uh, may have an effect on the policy. At least that's what we cartographers think. Absolutely, and then those maps in our um, in the last part of our presentation are really delivered to executive council uh, as part of their policy making sort of their decisions that they make. So um, that's it. Definitely has an influence, um, and they also um, have turned more and more to the public dashboard versus the COP that we have that's internal uh, for the information because now that we actually release a lot more information to the public. Um, than we put in our COP nowadays. Right. Well, I think I'm going to have to call it here. Uh, thank you all again uh, for presenting and for taking part in this uh, in, in the discussion. Uh, I really appreciate it. I think we've, we've uh, seen a lot of very interesting uh, applications of cartographic uh, design. Thank you, Byron. Thank you, um, thank you, thank you Byron. Byron, do you want to make people aware that the articles are actually available on our files? Yeah, that the files are at the bottom of the page and they're also available in Cartographica, the last issue. Oh, here we have a visual. All right, thanks to the attendees and the next session will start at 3.10. Uh, have a good day. <laughs>